Good morning and welcome to worship again today. I'm so glad many of you were able to join us and find our video online last week. And so I hope you will continue to do that, share it, put it out there for people uh, to see. It's amazing the evangelism that is happening, the video after video after video on YouTube. And it's really great uh, to see how Christ is being shared. And um, it's something that we maybe hadn't thought about when we first got into this and, oh my word, and how are we going to figure it out? Um, but it's really a neat thing that God is doing. And I'm starting to hear stories about that. It's, it's really wonderful. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, just a, a note about our plans. This was the last Sunday we had planned to be um, not in our sanctuary space. However, um, we have not made a decision about that. We're waiting to um, to kind of see, and we're going to meet tomorrow on uh, Monday, uh, probably via email or just text, and the council will decide here how we are going to um, proceed uh, based on recommendations from our governor, from the CDC, and um, from the people who are really paying attention to what it is we need to do to keep others safe. Um, with that, I don't have a whole lot of announcements. The newsletter came out. You should be getting that uh, tomorrow if you haven't gotten it yet, but I'm pretty sure um, they went out early enough that you would have gotten them this weekend. Um, the full calendar and everything is in that. Just be aware, it does say on that, you know, plans might change. We just wanted to have everything out for you. Um, if you have stories or things that you want to share in our next newsletter, please uh, email those to us, send them to us so that we can um, get them in and keep kind of a uh, conversation going amongst people. I know it's hard when we don't meet here and we can't, you know, chat and figure out how people are doing. Um, that's one way to keep up. Just tell us your stories. Tell us what's um, what's going on and, and we'll share those, okay? Uh, if you haven't picked up a First Communion book for your fifth grader or let me know, please do that. Um, I think I know a couple others, but in case I've uh, missed someone, I don't want that to happen. Just go through those and um, I'll look at them when we get back together and then we'll start planning First Communions. Okay. Um, and uh, as always, I thank you so much for those who have uh, given, who have sent checks into the church and who are who are giving, uh, we have lots of ways to do that through the website or um, on the, the mobile app. You can send checks in, you can have your bank do something, and we greatly appreciate that since we still need to pay bills and do things. Um, this time is not easy, uh, so, you know, we appreciate anything that you can give, prayers, um, help, uh, money, all of those things are greatly appreciated. God has a plan for each one of us, and um, we just so thank him that he has put you where you are now to help us when you can. So, all right, let's then take a moment. We're going to prepare our hearts for worship. today again is from Psalm 95 verse 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. 
We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are forgiven. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty Lord, you rule from on high. The holy angels bow down to you as they carry out your purpose. Thank you for defending us, for keeping us safe. Thank you for giving us your body and your blood. Keep us steadfast in faith and strong in courage until your final victory is brought to fulfillment in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our children's time. I am so excited that you could join us again. Uh, I know things are different. I hope your week went well. Did you have a good week? How's school going? Getting through all those packets and everything that you have to do? That's a lot of work, I know that it is, but um, your teachers have done such a good job preparing for you, and so we want to make sure we thank them. You could stick a little note in maybe when you send that back for them, okay? Well, today we have a special story. Your Sunday school lesson was uh, about the Lord's Supper, and so we are going to hear that story, and um, just like last week, I want to make sure that we pull up the picture and the words so you can see that, so I'm going to do that now for you. All right, if you look at the picture there, you can see Jesus with his disciples, and they are sharing in the Last Supper. So Jesus has some bread, and um, there's wine there, and we're going to read our story, okay? So, on the first day of the Jewish holiday of Passover, Jesus' disciples came to him and asked, Where do you want us to prepare the meal for Passover? Jesus told them to find a certain man in the city. Go and tell him, our teacher says, my time has come. I want to eat the Passover meal with my disciples in your home. Disciples did as Jesus told them and prepared the meal. That evening, when Jesus was eating with his 12 disciples, he said, one of you will surely hand me over to my enemies. The disciples were very sad. And each one said to Jesus, Lord, you can't mean me. But Jesus confirmed, one of you who has eaten with me from this dish will betray me. Indeed, the Son of Man will die as the scriptures say, but it's going to be terrible for the one who betrays me. That man will be better off if he had never been born. Then one of the disciples named Judas said, Teacher, you surely don't mean it will be me. You have said it with your own mouth, Jesus replied. And later, Judas did betray him. During the meal, Jesus took some bread in his hands. He blessed it and broke it. Then he gave it to his disciples and said, Take this and eat it. This is my body. Jesus picked up a cup of wine and gave thanks to God. He then gave it to his disciples and said, Take this and drink it. This is my blood, and with it, God makes his agreement with you. It will be poured out so that many people will have their sins forgiven. From now on, I am not going to drink any wine until I drink new wine with you in my Father's kingdom. What a story that is, isn't it? Hey, I think there's a place in our worship services where sometimes we celebrate a meal kind of like this. Any guesses? Hurry up, tell your parents before I tell you. Any guesses? That's right, communion. It's when we come up front to the altar area, kind of where I'm sitting, and we kneel, and the adults get bread and wine. 
And uh, I give blessings to the kids that are younger than fifth grade who haven't had first communion yet. And uh, when we receive that bread and wine, we're doing like what Jesus did in the story today. And we are remembering that he gave his body and blood for us. But actually, more importantly, Jesus is giving that to us. That's why we say given and shed for you when we give people the bread and the wine. In it, we hear God's word and we receive that forgiveness that he promises. And we receive God's grace in the eating and drinking. And um, we we come to the Lord's table and celebrate that. So um, if you are a fifth grader and going to do communion classes, you will have that soon. And then if you're younger than that and you're still you know, God comes and blesses you there when I give you that blessing. So we all receive something when we come to the table. I want to share with you too today our Bible rhyme just to go over the story again and have it. So, uh, and remember it. So here we go. In the days before he died, Jesus took his friends inside for one last meal to end the day to tell them what he had to say. This bread that I now give to you is my body, pure and true. This wine I pour out for your sake is my blood for all to take. Yes, this is my New Testament, the goal for which my life is spent. Your sin I promise to forgive, that in my kingdom you may live. This is the whole reason Jesus came to the earth was to forgive us, to give us a way back to heaven, to die for us and rise again so that we might have life. And um, it's amazing to see how he uh, teaches us about that through this Last Supper. Let's thank and praise God for everything he does for us now. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to come and die for us. We thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to do that. And Lord, we ask now in this time that you would remind us more than ever of your promises, that you are working for good, that you are taking care of us, that you give us everything that you have um, so that we might live. Help us to show that, whether it's putting hearts up in our windows or just uh, smiling at our family members or helping around the house, whatever that is, Lord. We pray that you would um, remind us uh, that we have lots of love to share because you first loved us. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Well, it was good to spend time with you even this way. I hope that you and your parents can spend some time talking together too more about the Lord's Supper, even if you want to... Um, you know, get together and talk about that more. That would be great. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to text me or to call me, or I can figure out a Zoom thing too if you want to ask any questions, and um, we'll stay in contact that way. All right, let's move on. Our readings this morning begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 26 through 32. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Here ends the first reading. And from Matthew 26, verses 17 through 29. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? As you go into the city, he told them, you will see a certain man. Tell him, the teacher says, my time has come, and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus said and prepared the Passover meal there. 
When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, Am I the one, Lord? And he replied, One of you who has just eaten from this bowl will betray me, for the Son of Man must die, as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for the man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, you have said it. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new in my Father's kingdom. Here ends the reading. Our sermon text today is from Psalm 119, verses 25 through 32. I lie in the dust. Revive me by your word. I told you plant my plans, and you answered. Now teach me your decrees. Help me understand the meaning of your commandments, and I will meditate on your wonderful deeds. I weep with sorrow. Encourage me by your word. Keep me from lying to myself. Give me the privilege of knowing your instructions. I've chosen to be faithful. I've determined to live by your regulations. I cling to your laws. Lord, don't let me be put to shame. I will pursue your commands for you expand my understanding. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, I have always loved the Psalms. There is a psalm for just about anything that you could possibly be feeling at any time in your life. There's psalms that deal with anxiety and anger and praise and worship and joy and wonder and I just got to get away from everything and, uh, you know, lament lamentations, complaining, all of that. Psalms that deal with each and every one of those things. There are psalms that told of Jesus' death, that tell us about Jesus' death. And there are psalms that assure us of life. If you want to read something that you will likely connect deeply with, I encourage you to turn to psalms. And it's pretty easy. If you hold the Bible and you just whoop, open it, you're going to get to psalms pretty quick. It's right about in the middle of the Bible. Well, if you hadn't noticed, over the last several weeks, we have been working our way through the longest psalm in the Bible. This is Psalm 119, and it is a feat of Jewish poetry. There is so much wrapped up into this text. It's really quite incredible if you've never looked at it. And we don't always get the whole picture when we look at it in English. And so we have to go into the Hebrew a little bit because that entire psalm actually is broken up. You're going to see that it's broken up into sections, and it follows the Hebrew alphabet. And it's written in this acrostic style. So you have eight lines per letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So what that means is that the psalm has 22 sections because there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. The first eight lines of the psalm all begin with Aleph, which is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And then the next eight lines begin with the second letter, Beth, and then Gimel, and then on and on through the whole alphabet. So Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth, Hey, yeah, we go on and on and on, okay? And it brings this sense of order to the words and the lines. It organizes them and lays them out in groups. This is unique, uh, a very unique part of Psalm 119. And there's so much that's being said simply in its form 
in addition to the actual words that are used. Now, we don't know who actually wrote this psalm, but the author certainly wanted to share many messages in it. The first is this. We worship a God who is a God of order. Hence the acrostic structure. He is not a God of chaos. And that is such a powerful message especially when we are amid a time that feels like we are just in a, a mass of chaos, right? I had a college friend this week who uh, wrote a blog, and um, she talked about in her blog about showing up at a hotel one time for breakfast, and when she got back to her room, she figured out that she talked to all these people and had breakfast with her pants on, not only inside out, but backwards, so the tag was sticking out the front. And she said that was such a fitting analogy for this pandemic that we are experiencing right now. And I agree with her. This is a time that certainly feels both inside out and backwards. And when we get to feeling that way, it's amazing how quickly and how easily we forget that God is in charge, that God is in control. I can feel that kind of rise up even in me, the panic. We forget that God is in all things and in charge of all things. Our God does not rule willy-nilly, making it up as he goes along, trying to patch leaks and put out fires. There is a plan for us, for our lives to work for good, even if we don't see it right now. We do not worship a God of chaos. We have a God who is all-knowing, all-seeing, and just because we feel turned around and backwards doesn't mean that God has lost control. In talking about this, my mind skips past Easter to when the disciples are huddling in their upper rooms and behind locked doors for fear of what might happen to them. I mean, their whole world is turned upside down as their teacher and savior is killed in this most horrible way. And I'm sure for them, that was not just scary, but also confusing and anxiety-inducing and chaotic. Yet in the times that Jesus appears to them after the resurrections, his words are, peace be with you. He says that every time he shows up, peace be with you. Be with you. When angels come and can tell news to people in the Bible, the first thing they say is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. All of heaven, when it comes to earth, seeks to calm our fears, to give us that sense of order and calm that is so needed when we are scared. And today, as God says, not only in the words of Psalm 119, but in the form of it, that he is still in charge, we can hear almost those other words that whisper to our hearts, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Listen again to the opening of this psalm. I lie in the dust. Revive me by your word. Listen again. I lie in the dust. Revive me by your word. It is the word that strengthens us now. Jesus Christ, who is the word, does not just say peace to you as if that makes it all better to have someone say it. Right? If I just said to you, get over it, you're okay, just stay in your house, you're going to be fine, calm down. Right? That doesn't do anything. But God's word is more powerful than that. It's more powerful than my word. Because Jesus' word, Jesus who is the word, actually creates that peace within us. He brings us to a place of faith so that we can say, ah, yes, now I feel peace. He revives us by the words that he speaks. God gives us life in this word today. You are not left in the dust. 
But in the psalm, you are shown God's order. You are given his word. You are sustained in him completely. And we know this. There's one more way that we know this because of Psalm 119. The author of the psalm is saying something profound in its creation by writing eight lines that use every letter of the alphabet. Have you ever heard that uh, God is the alpha and the omega? That's the same as what this author is saying. He's just saying that God is the aleph and the tau. The beginning of the alphabet, the end of the alphabet, and everything in between. He is the beginning and the end. There is no way that God is not working in the midst of this. There is no way that he intends to leave us here. Instead, he promises to pull us from the dust, to remind us of his ways and his promises. And that word is given for you. For your sustaining, for giving you peace, for calming your fears, for leading you out and giving you order in this time of chaos, but also in times of peace. The psalm today reminds us of all of that. And so may it give you peace and strength to be reminded that God is still in control, that your God, the one who saves you, carries you, and holds you in his loving hand, knows how you feel right now. He knows what you need right now, and he works in you, in all things, to calm your fears, to teach you his word, to lift you up out of the dust and the chaos. You can put your trust in him. I encourage you to take a look sometime at all of Psalm 119. And know that in it the author paints a picture of God who has chosen you. Amen. Please join me with me now in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join with me in the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive our benediction from Ephesians 3, verses 20 through 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, According to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.